Hey, somebody's got to pick the Satsumas. You have? Excellent. Good morning, afternoon, or evening. You are listening to The Professional Noticer. Hello, everyone. I'm Andy Andrews. Hey, thank you for making me a part of your week. My purpose here today and with every show we do is to play the part of a best friend or a coach. I want to help you live the life of your wildest dreams by giving you access to the greatest mentors the world has to offer today. The Professional Notes are sponsored this week by our friends at Tucker ATV. You know, the variety of power sport products at Tucker ATV will blow your mind. The Hustler Zero Turn Mowers, the entire line of Echo Power Tools, and of course, Tucker ATV carries every make and model of Polaris ATVs and side-by-sides. But you have to see the showroom to believe this place. The taxidermy, the antique displays, along with the customer service ports that's inside with its port swing, comfortable chairs, television, and free coffee. Did I mention the free coffee? They treat customers like family, which is why folks from 14 states have done business with Tucker ATV. It's Highway 43 North in Jackson, Alabama, the small town business with the national reputation. Well, observations and answers, that's what we do here on The Professional Noticer, and as you know, we love it when somebody comes to the table with both. And we have that situation today. We have uh, a guy who is a longtime friend of mine, and he is an author and a speaker, New York Times bestselling author. His latest book is Soundtracks. Please welcome John Acuff. Thanks for having me, Andy. I'm excited to be at the table. Buddy, I am glad you are here. Now, your family is down for Thanksgiving. We are. This is my um, every two years I get to see you. I play golf five times a decade. I see you five times a decade (laughs) because I play with my father-in-law and I'm terrible at golf. I have a lot better time during this conversation. Well, you know, hopefully, hopefully your golf game will go better than usual. It will not. It will not. No, I mean, I'm I'm a positive person. I lost 18 balls one round. 18. So now what they do is they bring me a sack of range balls and z- irons zip tied together. I don't even have a bag. It <laughs> looks like somebody kidnapped a set of irons. And so, yeah, I will destroy whatever golf game we have this week. But this conversation is something I'm excited about. Well, you know, golf is golf is tough. I, I have people occasionally ask me, do you play? And I, I say, no, I coach some players, but I can't play. No. I just, I just. Maybe can't. later on in life. It's too, it's too a patient of a sport for me. Well, I think the 18 holes is too many. Yeah. Nine is fine. I'm fine. Nine is nine. fine. Four Seven. would be good. Yeah. yeah. Four. Yeah. Four with friends. Sure. But you know, this, this is, this is a, it's a hard sport. And I, I love my favorite golf quote is Lee Trevino's when they ask him, you know, what does he do when he's on the course and lightning is is there? He says, "I hold a two iron above my head because even God can't hit a two iron." Yeah, yeah. My yeah. favorite golf quote is uh, Mark Twain: "Golf is a good walk ruined." <laughs> um, I've always found that to be true. That's very true. Well, oh, buddy, you, you, I, I knew you before you had gray hair. Yeah, I, and yeah. you were just beginning as a speaker, and now you're a powerhouse. Oh, I mean, thanks. You, you are. All over the world, all over America, right now, mm-hmm. and um, and you're just one of the most in demand speakers ever. I I thought we would talk today mm-hmm. about just the process of sure. it. So many people are interested in it mm-hmm. and want to do it. And so, how did you how did you get started? How did you feel like, hey, this is what I want to do? Well, I, I feel like a lot of people, if you get into professional public speaking, it starts often with you get an opportunity. And it might be, I get to present for 10 minutes at my office and I really liked it. It might be, I had a blog that did well and people asked me to speak. There's a million pathways into it. Um, My pathway was I had a blog, I was sharing ideas and somebody said, would you ever come speak at our conference? And I had never done that, but I had this idea. I think I can do that. I think I'd like that. I had the benefit of growing up with a dad as a pastor. So speaking wasn't unusual to me. I had seen somebody do that for years and years and years. Um, so I think there's a lot of different pathways into it. Mine was via the blog. Um, and as soon as I tried it, I was terrible. I mean, I was terrible, but you should always be bad at new things. You shouldn't be amazing. We have this misconception. Um, but I had this sense of, I think if I work really hard at this, this can be turned, turned into something that's a lot of joy. Did you, did you suffer much from stage fright? 
No, not really. Um, I suffer more from not being on a stage. I mean, like it's, really? I'd rather get up there. My, it's my favorite spot in the world. If you ask me my favorite, you know, some people say Hawaii or Tahiti. Like for me, that, that little bit of carpeted spot up there, I love being on stage. So no, I didn't have stage fright. Um, and then like one of the things you learn is the audience wants you to win. No one likes to see a terrible speech. It's uncomfortable for everybody. If you've ever been in an awkward conversation, multiply that times 100. So once you start to understand, the audience wants me to do well because they want to have a good time. They're for me. So I I mean, I get nervous still with speech, speaking, it, but it's a nervous excitement. It's not a dread. Um, but I, I don't know that I ever had tremendous stage fright. Now, I can probably talk myself into it. Like, yeah, I can talk yeah. myself into a lot of things. Right. But if I focus on the truth of the moment, that I'm here because I've worked really hard at this, that they want me to win, that I've I've practiced this, I've done the reps, I've put in the work, I you know I, I get up there and feel like I've been released from a cannon. And so, no, I enjoy it. See, my favorite place is on stage two. But I started, I started as a comedian. Mm -hmm. And... I had stage fright. But that's different. Comedian is a different, like, I think I've done comedy. I did two nights in, at Zany's in Nashville. And comedy is different because I heard Bill Burr, a comedian, say home audiences versus an away game. And yeah. so, like, when you sell tickets to an Andy Andrews event, that's a home audience. When you start as a comedian, that's at all away games. Oh, yeah. And so that's different. So I have tremendous respect for do that to do, for people that do that. But I think I think a lot of times when you're a public speaker, it's a home game. My oldest son, Austin, plays guitar. Mm -hmm. And so far he has played guitar like undercover. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, and it, but now it, it's like somebody comes over, hey, play. And and he said to me the other night, he said, Man, I, I wonder when I'm gonna get over this throat clenching fear mm -hmm. of and I and I said, well, I know what you're saying. And he looked at me like, you know. And I said, buddy, you you only know me now. Yeah. Okay. But you you didn't know me when I was starting. And I I remember John specifically. One I had a I had a date on a Saturday night. It was twenty five dollars to go between the bands because you know I started before there were comedy clubs everywhere. Yep. I mean, there were only two in New York and two in L.A. Mm -hmm. And so I had a $25 day to go between the bands at, at this place, the between the band sets. And, and it was a Wednesday night. And I can still remember I fried two pork chops and cooked rice. And I sat down to eat. And I thought about Saturday night I couldn't eat. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just, I just, I couldn't eat. And, and it, and I remember what it's like to walk into that room, you know, with those bands where, you know, people had never seen a live comedian. And of course, after they saw me, they still hadn't seen one. But, but I remember being terrified. And it's odd to me that something, something inside me just propelled me. I, I felt compelled to to speak to to be on stage just compare even though I was scared to death sure but I, I you know I, I I wanted to be a speaker but mm -hmm. you know when you're 22 23 who wants to hear what you have to say right. and so that comedy thing was the only way that I could figure out to be on stage yeah but, but I mean I think there's times where the the setup is more difficult than another setup so you know, I spoke at an outdoor music festival that was for like rap and screamo music and they had a speaker. That was challenging because no one was there to see the 30 minute speaker before Lecrae. Like they were all there to see Lecrae. And then I came out and was like, hey, hey, here's an additional 30 minutes you have to wait. That's a difficult setup. Um, or, you know, I spoke at a, an event and it was a rooftop bar in Chicago and they weren't expecting a speaker and they're all enjoying the view. They're like hat, like 90% of the audience was turned with their backs to me. So right. like, I look at that and go, okay, 
This is going to be 40 minutes where I'm going to do my job. It's going to be as excellent as can be. But I'm also not going to judge myself on, did they give me a standing ovation here? Because that's not the setup. So right. there's moments like that where you still, I don't think you're ever past those kind of moments because you just keep doing challenging things. But if you enjoy it, you're willing to do that because you got to do the thing you love the most. And so I always tell people, like, when it comes to figuring out your calling, your purpose, there's so much pressure with that. But I think it's easy when you find something, you'll put up with a lot of other things. I'll put up with every missed flight, every delayed flight, every travel hassle, whatever. If I get to go serve an audience for 30 minutes in Topeka, Kansas, like, get me on a plane, I'm there. So I... I love it like that. And so I'm willing to do some of the things that might be awkward or might be uncomfortable because the trade-off is worth it so much. How, how controlling are you about your audience situation? I mean, with, with, your, with your contract writer and then with when you get there and they ignore your contract writer. Oh, I'm that. not, I'm not at all. I mean, I'm really, I, I mean, there's like, I, I, I'm really low maintenance. I like, I like high maintenance people because they make my job easy. Right. Cause you know, so if you're rude to people, if you're super demanding, if you're like, and I show up and go, I want a small table and a bottle of water if you got one. Like, so I'm super low maintenance. Um, I, you know, I, I will say like, Hey, I, I want to use my own mic. Cause I have a custom ear mold just cause that, that gives me the assurance that the mic's going to fit. It's not going to be flopping around and I'm going to staple it to my head with, you know, like, so that would be the only thing, but I've had people say, Oh, this other speaker wanted a baby grand piano to play in the green room to relax himself. And I was like, hooray that like, give me a harp. Like that's ridiculous. So yeah. I, stuff like that. Um, I mean, I'm super detailed with what I'm going to do. I'm like, I know exactly what I'm going to do, but I try to be very over accommodating to the event planner. Like I'm for me, when I realize it's an act of service, like the C, I want the CEO to look good. I want the event planner to right. look good. I'm there for 30 minutes. They're all, they're there all year. Right. So I like, if I can make them win, then it's a win for all of us. So yeah. I try to be super low maintenance. It, it is funny having gone, I, I mean, one of my favorite questions to ask when I go speak is who's the best you've ever had yeah. and who's the worst you've ever yeah. had? Because both of those questions, one is informative and the other one's just fun to hear. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, and but they'll say stuff like, I remember I asked that question. I always say like, you don't have to tell me their name, but what was difficult? And they go, well, the person wouldn't give us their flight information. So we didn't know when they were coming in. Like, and they wouldn't let us. And so like, that makes an event planner stressed, not knowing that you're there. And so like, I'll hear that and go, oh, you know what? I should text the minute I land in the city and go, hey, just got here, really excited about it, and yeah. reassure that person. Yeah, like, I would want to be relax reassured. and know, yeah. know that you're there. Yeah. Cross that off the list. And right. so I, yeah, I, the more I do it, the more I see the customer service side of it. And like, I, like one of my goals for speaking is I want the sound team to be laughing because the dude running the soundboard at the JW right. Marriott has heard every He's speech. Heard if every I've got that guy laughing, right. I'm killing the crowd. Yep. Like if I've got that guy paying attention, I'm killing the crowd. And so those are the kind of, or I'll say, I want the event planner to be getting text messages during my keynote. Yeah. I want yeah. her phone to be blowing up from people going, hey, this is a great, this is the right person, way to go. I want them to look like a rock star because again, they're there all year. I'm there for 30 minutes. Right. I had, uh, I had an instance one time in Michigan. I was talking to the to the event planner that was the person parked there. You know, they mm. owned the company or whatever. It was, a, it was an organization. There was like 6,500 people going to be there. And I could tell this guy was very nervous. Mm. You know, he was like, now do you, uh, you know, now now will you be, and now how are you going? I mean, it, it just you could mm. just tell. Sure. And at one point, I, I said, because it, I knew it was a yearly thing, and so at one point I said, you know, pardon me for saying so, but you seem kind of nervous about mm -hmm. me. Are, are, is, is there anything okay? Mm -hmm. And, you know, smile. And he said, uh, yeah, he said, we just had a disaster last year. We had more people than we ever had because, and, and they, they uh, had a speaker come in who had just been in a huge movie, okay? Mm -hmm. And and so and he was the star of this huge movie. And they said, we have more people buy tickets to this than anything. And it was just terrible. 
Mm-hmm. It was terrible. And I said, well, can I tell you why? And he said, sure. I said, you hired an actor. Mm-hmm. I said, I'm a speaker. Yeah. I said, there's a difference. If you'd mm-hmm. given the guy a script, he'd have been great. Yeah. Okay. But but there is a big difference. And and I, I think a lot of times I, I find guiding them is is good mm-hmm. with their, you know, with, and when I said a minute ago about controlling, I, I didn't mean, I didn't mean really like rude or demanding. Mm-hmm. I meant, you know, there are things that uh, somebody who does, see, we are going places that people are doing this once a year. Mm-hmm. And we're doing it over and over again. Yeah, and and so I find that there are there are some things that they just don't understand to do, mm-hmm. or don't understand why I ask. Because my my rider is much the same as yours. Mm-hmm. My rider is a bottle of Dasani water, yeah. and um, and I I also put uh, the the front row mm-hmm. uh, eight feet. From the edge of the stage. Mm-hmm. Now, they don't do it seventy five percent of the time. Yeah. Okay, but I don't ever say anything about it. But that's where I develop just walking out into the audience. Yeah, because it, it, you know if you're, and that's why I'm talking about controlling the situation. Because you know if you're set forty feet away from the mm-hmm. first row and you're speaking to them. It's like trying to hold a conversation with somebody who is sitting on the other side of the living room. Yeah. And and it's just different than if you're you and I are right here. Mm-hmm. And so I found through the years that when people walk out, nobody says, Well, we were a long way away from the speaker and we were scattered out throughout mm-hmm. the auditorium and the lighting wasn't good and yeah. the sound was not good. They don't walk out saying that. They just walk out going, it wasn't that great. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. And so I, I, I always try to explain to them, you know, if I have the opportunity, mm-hmm. why? Well, and that's part of leading, though. That's part of guiding right. and part of going, okay. And I'll do that when it comes to, like, okay, um, here's, you know, here's what a pan, here's what I've seen a good panel go well. Here's, you know, let's not leave an hour for Q&A. Because the thought is, so often the thought is, like, our crowd is super talkative. They're going to ask, and I, they're not. And you they're know not. they're not. They're, <laughs> they're not. just not. And so if, so going, okay, well, let's leave five minutes, and I'll have content to go if nobody goes, but let's not leave an hour. Like So I'll, I'll guide that way and go, okay, here's what I saw work at FedEx. Here's what I saw work at Nissan. Here's what I saw work at Walmart. And so that gives them a sense of, okay, this is professional. But back to the actor, the thing there is like, if you've got someone who's amazing at winning Super Bowls, they won't be an amazing public speaker because they're amazing at winning Super Bowls. I'm terrible at throwing touchdowns. I am. If I was in that game, I'd be terrible. So in that situation, you might go, okay, a Q&A would be great. Have a, like, have a great right. interview with that person. Don't put them up behind a podium and go, teach us for 45 minutes the practical applications we can learn about being accountants from throwing Super Bowl touchdowns. Right. And then you go, wow, that's that that quarterback wasn't that good. Right. He's an amazing quarterback. So like that that kind of thing I will guide when there's when there's an opportunity. Right. Right. So what what is the what is the biggest disaster you ever had? On, well, I mean the on the stage. The um the music festival definitely, but that was a I shouldn't have taken that gig. That I should have outdoors, outdoors, wrong crowd, middle of the day. So it's a disaster because at night there's a light to point people's attention. During right. the day, there's multiple stages going. That's another disaster because then people can go leave and see something else. Um, and their expectation wasn't set. They weren't. So I should have said no to that setup, but I was young. I was, I was kind of in a say yes to everything mode. So like if you had had opened a car wash, I would have been there like talking about right. the bubble strength. So that was probably the one. And then the other one was I showed up and they asked me to add three things that we hadn't discussed. And 
I was, I said, okay, sure. And so I quickly wrote these three things, but they weren't the quality of the thing I had rehearsed and planned and practiced. Right. So I should have known, now I would know to go, hey, you know what? Like, I would love to do that, but it's not going to be the best experience. And where I've matured in that is I was at a big event, 5,000 people, and they said, hey, we want you to start your speech by doing a selfie for our Instagram. I said, no, I actually, I have an opener that's really specific to what I'm going to do. Let's do it at the end. So I was still accommodated it. Right. But I had the wisdom to know if I walk out, crowd doesn't know me, and I start by going doing a selfie in an obnoxious way, it sets up a bad relationship that I'm going to spend the rest of the speech trying to recover from versus at the end of it, once I've earned the crowd's trust and right. attention, I can do a selfie at the end and still support the client. But so like that stuff that I've learned over the years to go, oh, wait a second, here's what the best would look like. Um, but I haven't had a where it was like something... I mean, okay, I had a fire alarm. I had a fire alarm recently oh, where the yeah, whole man. building had to be evacuated. I've had one And of so I'm 15 minutes in, entire building's evacuated. We stand outside in the parking lot for 30 minutes. I have to come in and kind of restart the thing. But I, but I, like, the same way you are, I loved it because I was like, I'm going to kill this when I get back. Like, I have, we all have a shared experience. Yeah, like, have more material. I'm going to work yeah. all this material in. So, like, I did a, tur I had a turtle pee on me during a bit I went, and I was like, this is gold. Like I knew that I was about to ride this amazing wave of a shared experience. Oh yeah. So I, now that I'm comfortable enough on stage, if something like that happens, then I can try to figure it out. And then plus you 10 years ago were like, Hey, I have a plan for the waterfalls. I have a plan for the sound. Like you were really detailed about, I have contingency plans and contingency material if something goes. So if you think about it, which is why that's another difference from a public speaker and somebody who gets to speak occasionally, is this is what I'm doing. I should be proficient and excellent at it because right. um, it's my profession in the same way that you wouldn't be like, the dentist sure seemed casual with my root canal. He'd be like, we well, better be amazing. The endodontist better be amazing at root canals because that's, that's what right. he's doing. That's what she's doing. And I and what you're referencing is that I had <clears throat> I had a disaster one night that was just kind of very nothing, but it what happened and I was working as a comedian mm -hmm. and I, I forget even what happened. Some door slammed over here, somebody dropped a glass, uh, there was a loud sound or something, and the whole audience did that and I did too. And then I go back and I didn't have anything to say and I tried to continue and I could just tell it, it had been doing this and doing this yeah. and it just kind of it leveled off. And so I went home that night and I said, I'm going to have something to say for everything. Mm -hmm. And because, because if I'd have had something to say, if somebody drops a tray of drinks and everybody looks and I go, yeah, just – put it down anywhere. <laughs> then they laugh yeah. and then we can go again. And and so I literally I spent a year coming up with okay, somebody, you know, runs naked across the room. The phone lights go off. out. The phone yeah. goes off. So you know, somebody yells something unintelligible. Somebody drops something. Somebody has a heart attack. I I mean I had something yeah. to say for everything. And and so it but that that has helped throughout the years. And you know it's it, it I also, there's so many things that you're mentioning that I really connect with. Mm -hmm. And one of those is having the wisdom on what to do and what not to do. Mm -hmm. And because I, I was the same way, I used to take anything, mm -hmm. you know. And, and you know, when you're doing it for free or you're doing it for very little money mm -hmm. and you you're put in a bad situation and it doesn't go well. Nobody really cares. But there's a point where they're paying an amount that they care. Yeah. Well, and my the, 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 the transition for me was I used to love to surprise people. So I would show up. They hadn't heard of me and I would surprise them. Young guy nobody ever heard of. But then, you know, fast forward 15 years of doing this, Microsoft has an expectation when they hire me. Like right. when they hire me to speak to the Xbox team, the expectation is I better kill it. So guess what? I'm going to kill it when I go there and I'm going to prepare and, and plan. Um, but as far as like part of it is like anything else in life is figuring out what you're good at, what you're not good at. I know, for instance, I will never host an event. 
I'm terrible at hosting events. Hosting an event is different than a keynote. I don't like it's that a either. Different, it's a different art. And there's people who are amazing at it. I personally, Ken Coleman, Ken he's Coleman's the host. Great. He is amazing at it. Where for me, it's sequence. I'm not good at sequence. It's remembering details. It's on the fly stuff. That's not what I hosted one event. Um, and I forgot, there's a disaster. You've asked, I forgot about this one. Hosting an event. I thought the event was over. Co-host is off the stage. I'm trying to call her up like, let's end this event. She's shaking her head and kind of off the stage. And there's like six foot two beautiful African-American woman standing behind me trying to come on and do a spoken word poem. She's the last part of that. I'm closing the event. I don't even see her. Whole crowd sees her. I forget her name. And I go to myself, okay, I can either, either like say her craft or just guess at her name. So like I can even go, ladies and gentlemen, spoken word, or I can try to guess her name. And so I go, ladies and gentlemen, Amani, and her name is Amina. So to this day, when I see her, we're still friends. 10 years <laughs> later, if I see her at a green room, she goes, it's Amani. Her name is Amina Brown. She's amazing. But that was a great reminder for me. Like, oh yeah, don't host events. Like you're not good at this. Keynote, 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 don't host events. And so figuring that out over time and going, okay, what am I good at? What am I not good at, because sometimes people go, well, you're good on stage, so you must be good at all things on stage. Right. And, and you not. must be good for kids, and yeah. I, I don't do yeah. children's stuff. Well. Oh, yeah, no, that's not what, but it's also not where my muscle is. I'm doing 50 or 60 corporate events a year. That's where my space is. That's the kind of books right. I write. So if somebody goes, hey, we'd love you to come speak at a middle school assembly, no, I won't be good at that, and I won't serve you. Culturally, uh, you know, it, it's just like comedy. If the, if Speaking is like comedy in that if they don't have the cultural literacy to understand what you're saying, yeah. you know, I, I remember the first time I ever did anything in Canada, and I was right in the middle of an Abraham Lincoln line, and I happened to think, he wasn't their president. Yeah. I wonder if they know who he is, yeah. you know? Yeah. And and so it's— uh, For me, that's— uh, when I spoke, I spoke at an event in Athens, Greece, and I had to change a lot of my humor because it was Americanized. Right. So I had to go, okay, if I'm speaking to an audience in Portugal, are they going to appreciate this joke about Will Smith from the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air? Maybe not. Like, maybe there's some things like Michael Jordan, Taylor Swift, like international things, but a lot of it, if it's regional, they're not going to get, so I need to tweak that. And you don't understand how much of your humor is Americanized until you go to a foreign audience and go, right. oh, I, I should have done the work on the front end. And the cultural literacy is, is everything with it, with a joke. I Last night, uh, mm -hmm. Polly, Austin, and I were watching an old Wings episode. Mm -hmm. You remember that? Sure, you love Wings. And, um, Nantucket Airport. Yeah, and they had they had crash-landed in a cornfield. Mm -hmm. And so they were, it was at night, and they were trying to find help. They'd gone different directions. And Stephen, he comes out of the cornfield to the plane, mm -hmm. and he turns to the cornfield, and he says, thanks, Shoeless Joe, yeah. and then walks on. And I looked over at Austin, and I said, do you catch that reference? And he goes, no, no sir. What, if you, I thought you were going to say, if you build it, they will come. No, but, but I said, it's a reference to Field of Dreams, yeah. you know? And if you hadn't seen the movie, it doesn't mean anything. Yep. And so that's why, you know, doing an elementary school is like, I, 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 I. Yeah. and so I, I had, I had a, a situation one time where I was offered uh, 20 minutes on a big stage and I knew 20 minutes is not my fastball. Mm -hmm. um, and so I turned it down and Premier, even, you know, this is the agency sure. you and I are with, and they they were like, you got to do this. You have mm -hmm. to do this. This is like, this can bring you so much work. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I said, well, not if it doesn't go well. Yeah. It does reverse. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing with hosting. So here's the, like, say hosting as an example. If I host and it goes well, what happens? I get other hosting gigs, which I don't want. If I host and it doesn't go well, it doesn't go well, I don't get any gigs. So that's a lose-lose. So right. you're constantly going, okay, 
Where's there a win? Where's there a loss? What do I, you know, and I think that we have to acknowledge that the role of TED Talks has changed people's expectations. So unfortunately what happens is somebody goes, I saw a 12 minute TED Talk from an astronaut who landed on the moon and it was a compelling story told in 12 minutes. And they go, every story could be like that. And that's not the case. And so there's different situations. And so I I think for me, it's understanding, okay, well, where is this going to be a real win? And where is this? I saw somebody at an event. It was a singer and it was a 10,000 person event, huge opportunity for them. And they butchered the song. They forgot all the words of the song. And I found out later from mutual friends, they had been sprung that song that morning. It wasn't a song they knew. And they're an amazing singer, super talented. And somebody said, sing this song. And boy, like it was excruciating. To say no. No, I don't know that song. It's not, I don't even know the words. I'm going to get up there in front of 10,000. And it was excruciating. And, And so like for me, it's, that's part of the being proficient at the, at the craft. And taking I, it like a craft. I had a, uh, I know that you recently did a thing for mm-hmm. Range Rover. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Ty Bullard was there. And, yep. and you did a thing for Range Rover and it was like 17 minutes. Mm-hmm. And and when I heard that, I thought, yeah, I remember that. I had uh, I had a, a big car conglomerate mm-hmm. that uh, I did in, I forget where I did it, but but it was a ton of people and it was the first big car thing that I had done with, mm-hmm. with General Motors. And, and uh, I was contracted for 50 minutes. Mm-hmm. And when I got there, the, the sound guy says, hey, uh, we're, we're cutting you uh, to 20. Ooh. And I said, um, I appreciate that, but yeah. I, 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 that's I, a big cut. Yeah. And and he said, no, we're cutting you to 20. And I said, you know, I, I appreciate the opportunity, but I, my contract says 50, mm-hmm. and I, that's what I prepared for. And he said, well, you're going to do you're going to do 20. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was pretty rude about it. And mm-hmm. and I said, well, I said, uh, let's let's talk to the boss. Mm-hmm. And so the head guy, the uh, there's seven General Motors divisions. Mm-hmm. And so the head guy of that division comes and he says, hey, Andy, do, is there a problem? And I said, well, maybe not. I said, but, mm-hmm. you know, you got me, right? I said, you, you're you the one who asked for me, right? Mm-hmm. And he said, right, I did. I said, no, where did you see me? And he told me and I said, so why did you, why did you get me? He said, well, because you have them laughing and have them crying. And, mm-hmm. and I said, right. And I need 50 minutes to do that. Mm-hmm. I said, I can't have them laughing and crying both in 20 minutes. Yeah. And, That's a fast emotional roller coaster. Yeah. And, and I, I said, I know what you want, and I don't want to let you down. Mm-hmm. And I would, I would rather just... I said, I know this doesn't probably seem like a lot of money to you, but this is a lot of money to me. Mm -hmm. And And I respect that. Yeah. Yeah. And I I said, and if if I you know, if I am less than excellent Mm -hmm. for you, I said that word gets around about your judgment bringing me in Mm -hmm. and about my abilities as other people talk about it. And Mm -hmm. so I just want to make you look good. I don't want to give you what you expect. He said, you're right. Do the 50 minutes. So you got the 50. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's great. So That's great. And, and, you know, you can prepare. Obviously, you can prepare for 17. Totally. But totally. But but if like that's where, you know, so when speaker when people say they want to speak, I always say, you know, you know, you've got to have content. Start creating content. Like you've got to have something to speak from. That's the key. Like you've got to have content. But little things like when I get to an event, I'll say, How much time do I have? Because sometimes it will have shifted. And I remember, I'll never forget, I was at an event, it was in San Diego. And the speaker before me, I was backstage. He asked the sound person. The sound person said, yeah, you got 95 minutes. So he's at minute 55 of his keynote. I'm in the back of the room with the, the event planner. And the event planner hey, puts her hand up for five minutes. The speaker stops it and goes, 
I can't see what you're saying. They say five minutes left. And he goes, but I thought I had 35. And they said, no. And I talked to him after and, and he had like 40 slides left. And so for me, I never, it's, I never assume I'm always asking the time. I'm always double checking. So I think the on-site stuff is every bit as important as here's what I've prepared. Oh yeah. But I, I mean, I, for me, I like like you being prepared, but also allowing stuff to happen in the moment that we're all experiencing for yeah. the first time. And so it's this dance and I, I love it. I love changing out jokes. It's interesting what joke will work in one city that won't work in another. So it just feels like it's so fun to me, the craft of it. Do you um do you use slides? Yeah, oh yeah, totally. Yeah. Love slides. And my slides are gorgeous. I have like that's one of the mistakes a lot of speakers make is they feel like they have to build the slides. Like if you're going to talk on a speech maybe all year and you're going to change it and tweak it and customize it spots, but spend 300, 400, 500 dollars on a professional designer who creates amazing slides. And so I get compliments on my slides all the time and it's not that I created them, it's that I worked with somebody who's proficient in that. And so, yeah, and they usually, my rule is always, it needs to be something so short, I'd tweet it. Like I want six words and I want them to be sticky. Right. So like one of my slides about empathy says, um, read less minds, ask more questions. Six words, read less minds, ask more questions. And then I open it with a joke about like, and I know if you're into grammar, it should say read fewer minds, but less was a better rhythm and rhythm is a dancer. So I went with less and I feel good. And so like <laughs> open it, you know, like, and so I love the dance of that. And then right. I can go into stories and like, my, the way I create, um, a lot of it's based off of something Dorothy Parker said, who is a writer in the sixties, that creativity is a wild mind with a disciplined eye. So the wildness is you capture all these different sources and then you have the discipline of your eye to see the relationship. And that's how you create too. Like you're a classic example of that, of going, okay, here's something Austin said. Here's the way a menu was written. Here's something I heard at the airport. And then you see the thread between it and you create this really beautiful mosaic that surprises people. And they don't know where it's going, but it always takes them to a place that they're glad to get to. And so that's how I kind of think about a speech. Nice way of saying that. Thanks. Thanks. Well, that's what you do. That's 100% what you do. Buddy, tell us about uh, about your newest book, Soundtracks. Yeah. So um, Soundtracks is about um, mindset. It's essentially a book about mindset. I've had a lot of people say, did you write it because of the pandemic? I wrote it before the pandemic. Um, and just now everybody is struggling with mindset because we've had such a challenging last right. 18 months. Um, so the core of the book is about how do you retire your broken soundtracks? So I call a repetitive thought a soundtrack. How do you replace it with a new soundtrack? And how do you repeat the new one so often it becomes as automatic as the old one? Most people don't understand they get to choose what they think and that they have control over that. Um, and so, you know, they there's a there's a an interruption right there. Yeah. Um, I feel like, is that Monday Night Football theme song? It is. Okay. That's Monday that's, Night Football theme that's song. That's funny. That's funny. So, so, yeah, so that's what the book's about. It's, a mind, it's about how do you build a winning mindset. So let me ask you one last question. Yeah. All right. I'm not going to ask you. Where can we get the book? Because I know we can get it anywhere. anywhere Where yeah. would you prefer we get the book? I'd prefer you get it on Amazon. Um, if you want to read the first chapter for free, it's soundtracksbook.com. And I have a podcast called All It Takes is a Goal. And if you only listen to one episode, I'd either listen to Greg Sankey, who's the SEC commissioner. Yep brilliant leader, or Colleen Berry, who lost her job during the dot-com bust, figured out a way to get four other jobs. She was a secretary at one of them, and she changed her mindset. And today, she's the CEO of that company. So she went from secretary to CEO. It's a really encouraging journey that I think a lot of people get um, some, some wisdom out of. All it takes is a goal. Awesome. Well, we will have uh, all the links to you in the show notes. And thank you it's so much. It's always fun. I'm glad I got to do it live at the table. Yeah, man. Hope it's better than the golf game. It, it already is. I assure you. Okay. <laughs> all right, man. John Acuff. I'm Andy Andrews, the professional noticer, harnessing common sense and wisdom to plow through challenges all the way to answers for you. And I think that'll do it for this week. Get us out of here, Matthew. So, ladies and gentlemen... And to the boys and girls who aspire to become, ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of another episode of The Professional Noticer. In a world where common sense has become a superpower, I'm harnessing the tiny bit of mental energy I have for you. Seeking wisdom, making observations, and endeavoring to answer tough questions in a way that will empower your family and your business. I'm Andy Andrews. Until next week, goodbye. This episode of The Professional Noticer was produced by Matt Limpert. The Noticer theme, written and performed by Sugarcane Jane. 
Atomic Fireball Jawbreakers, provided for the cast and crew by Twinkle and Smoke of Beverly Hills. Additional financial consideration provided by Contemporary Kitty Cuisine. Friends, times have changed since you were a youngster. What thrilled you just doesn't do it for today's child. Movies, television, music, what to you was edgy and perhaps a bit frightening, nowadays can't hold the attention of an eight-year-old. Fun foods are the same. Contemporary Kitty Cuisine understands that vanilla chocolate or strawberry ice cream is no longer satisfactory. Today's ice cream must contain psychedelic colors, turning lips and tongue green or blue or black. Cherry and licorice jelly beans were once a treat. Now, jelly beans must explode in the mouth or possess exotic tastes like pina colada or margarita. Though one might wonder how kids know what pina colada or margarita tastes like anyway. Research has shown that the animal crackers you consumed as a child won't raise a smile on the face of the modern rug rat. That's why contemporary kitty cuisine has raised the stakes on a whole new crop of animal crackers. No longer will you have to present docile sheep or slow camels to your child. No more silly seals or giraffes. Everyone in the box broken at the neck. Introducing Animal Crackers, the Danger Edition. Your child will be enthralled by the same bland cookie, but now in the shape of rattlesnakes, tarantulas, piranhas, rabid wolves, and crocodiles holding human forms in their jaws. That's Animal Crackers, the Danger Edition at your supermarket now with the easy-to-spot Skull and Crossbones logo.